George has been a legend in the uh, OCR and document understanding and uh, machine learning community for many years. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. Today he's going to talk about uh, classifiers that improve with use. He's going to talk about a variety of topics uh, around OCR and machine learning. Without Thank you very view. much. Thank you for uh, letting me come and talk here. <clears throat> I'm an old guy, so I'm going to show you um, all, uh, all ideas. This is the thesis. There is never enough training samples. So what do you do when there are not enough training samples? Um, um, I'm, I'm going to let you read some of the slides because I think you can read faster than I can talk. There is nobody illiterate here, I assume. Um, Um, this is maybe what I cover, or may, maybe not. Stop me any time. You all know this, but this is the uh, representation I will use. Here there are two classes, circles and X's, and they, are the, they have a probability distribution for two features. We can only show two features in two dimensions, and um, we have some equiprobability contours. There are, of course, more, more than uh, one equiprobability contour for each, uh, each class. Um, these appear to be Gaussian, as far as we can tell, and there is some kind of a decision boundary that separates the x's from the o's. So I'll use uh, this representation, which I think is familiar to all of you. These are the cases that uh, I think are interesting, and this may be the, uh, if there is one slide to remember, this may be the slide to remember. Um, the simple case is when we have uh, representative samples, that means that the distribution of the test set is similar to the training set, there is no problem. We, we create some kind of a decision boundary. Here I'm showing a linear decision boundary, but it could be any decision boundary at all. It's linear, it's, it's uh, simplest. In this case, we have plenty of training samples, but the, uh, but the, uh, but the test data comes in groups of homogeneous samples. We call them isogenous because they are from one source. So they could, it could be a book, in a particular typeface, or it could be a, a business form in a, one person's handwriting, or it could be a billboard uh, with uh, one display uh, font. And in that case, if we have a training set, if, if we train the classifier on all the, um, all the data, this would be the decision boundary, but if we can somehow use the information from the test data, we can get a more accurate, uh, a more accurate uh, boundary. Um, these two cases are similar in that we have, um, um, again, we have one of many, many, um, many, many um, styles or typefaces or, uh, or um, handwritings, different kinds. In this case, we can assume that the means of the individual distribution, distributions are distributed as Gaussians. And in that case, it's possible to develop a classifier for any single source document that is optimal. In this case, what we would really like to do is something like font recognition, but font recognition has some problems with it, and uh, you can do better than that. But uh, these cases are sort of similar to this. Then we have a situation here, which is the most difficult situation, and which we really <laughs> is difficult, where um, the only relationship between the training data and the test data is in a sense a topological relationship that the, uh, the uh, features for the blue are bigger 
than the features for the red in both cases. It's some kind of a topological relation, but there is no overlap between the distributions. And if we know what the relationship, then we can use some heuristic, but if we don't, it's a difficult problem. So I'm going to show you, any, any question about this, uh, uh, this slide? The, uh, what uh, the difference, I just want to say that the difference between here and here, as you will see, one possibility is that all the patterns um, in a single source data from a single class are similar. And then it's possible to use adaptation. We can somehow estimate the new means, or the parameters of the new distribution or non-parametric distribution. But it is possible that there are only a few samples, for example, um, in a zip code, zip code recognition, there is not enough samples to estimate the probabilities of zeros, ones for this, the particular zip, uh, zip code. And in that case, the best you can do is infer from the characteristics of the twos what the ones look like. And that's different from adapting on the same class. This is the conventional classifier that we have seen since the 1950s. There is a training set. We estimate some parameters. There is some hidden input that nobody talks about, metaparameters, a little fiddling there. Um, and then we have uh, test data. We recognize them. We either recognize the class or we reject them. Either way, we may want to do some proofreading and find a few mistakes in the labels. All the rejects are manually entered, and we get a transcript. Conventional um, uh, system. So this is our straw man that we should do better than. Um, the classifiers themselves And there may be others. Um, here, in any case, the rejects are normally keyed in. But very few of the engines for OCR connect the reject entry, which may even be done somewhere else, with the classifier. They don't have provisions, but they should, for routinely using every correction to reestimate the classifier parameters. They should, have, they, they should be done routinely. Nothing should ever be corrected. It's, 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 a, it's an engineering problem, not a scientific uh, uh, problem. The only difference here is that if the classifier is already pretty good, then um, maybe you can do a best guess. Uh, you can use the classifier labels instead of the reject entry labels to retrain the classifier. And this is a, an old um, idea, and I'll show you some uh, some results. Uh, this is a picture from uh, 1966. I was working at IBM. This is the results of this of using the uh, classifier results for retraining on a set of uh, 22,000 uh, printed patterns of various type fonts. And you can see that there was a significant um, improvement. At that time, this kind of experimentation was difficult because uh, computers were so slow that both the feature extraction and the feature comparisons the classifier itself was performed in hardware. It was a complicated mixture of, um, uh, of uh, IBM 1800, 1401 computer and a gigantic shift register of 1,000 bits, which, uh, which shifted the patterns and extracted the features. But uh, the idea was there. And uh, this looks like magic, because all it's, 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 it's bootstrapping. So uh, I, I showed that. Well, this is how it works. Some of you have seen uh, this picture before. Here is a multi-font training set, and this is the best linear classifier that we can do. 
but notice, now look carefully at the fonts and I colored them to make it easy. This goes with this, this goes with that, and this goes with this in a particular document. Okay, these are just different typefaces. And the reason for that is that any typeface designer always designs the font so that within that font, all the characters are distinguishable. Well, they try. The same for handwriting. Your handwriting, one character may not be differentiable from another person's different class, but you can ought to be able to read your own handwriting. So you're, it's different. So uh, when you only have examples of the blue, uh, blue font, then um, this classifier that you train makes some mistakes. And this is a mistake because it classifies this blue. This is obviously blue, but it classifies this as red, and it classifies this red as blue. However, if you now take nothing more, more complicated than take the centroid of all the things that were classified as blue, so the centroid is not here but up here because of those patterns, and the centroid here is moved down, then, uh, then uh, use the bisector of the um, classifier, then you have a new classifier that's essentially error-free. So this is the, you know, it looks like you're getting something for nothing, and you are. So uh, I showed this uh, 30 years later to Henry Baird, and he was skeptical as he ought to be, and, um, and I said, try it. And so he tried it on uh, millions of his pseudo-random thing uh, characters. Now, the, uh, there are not error rates here, because the error rates on the different, this is 100 fonts, and on some fonts, the error rate is 2%. On other fonts, it's 0.02%. So we are only talking about how much the error rate is reduced, not about what it actually is. The averages are essentially meaningless. They are dominated by the most error-prone classifier, and you can see that almost all the fonts improved in all the different sizes, and the ones that got worse only got a little worse, so finally his conclusion was that there is a large potential for green and low downside, uh, uh, downside risk. Uh, this was at the time when he was wearing a manager hat, so this is uh, not uh, so technical uh, uh, parlance. Um, they, these, all these things were just uh, estimating the mean, but if you estimate the variance the same way, uh, you get further improvements. And Harshavira Machanini, um, who was uh, my, my uh, student, um, tried that, and it worked um, as expected. So, uh, so you may well ask if, um, if uh, estimate unsupervised quote, unquote, estimation of the mean and the variance is good. What about the covariances? Well, it turns out that it requires, these are uh, real uh, things with 50 features. Uh, there are uh, 1,200 covariances. Uh, you need for every class tens of thousands of patterns. So you really need very large documents, possibly books, but um, nothing that we had available. Uh, covariances need for uh, unsupervised estimation for each source need much larger uh, <clears throat> data set. A different, um, different idea um, completely. Um, sometimes you want to uh, use uh, human interaction, and the usual thing is that there is a fair amount of human interaction when you acquire the data and then the computer runs and runs, and at the other end, there is some human correcting mistakes. And the question is, can you use interaction more effectively? And this particular project is on flower uh, recognition. Um, one of the very nice things about flowers is that the field work is so pleasant. We collected these flowers in many expeditions to the New England Flower Garden. I don't know if uh, you know that. That's a, a half an hour wildflower garden. It's about half a mile of Marlboro. Uh, half uh, an hour from Boston. Uh, you may well ask the philosophical, you, we can't use ordinary flowers because ordinary flowers don't have class distinctions. They, they are hybrids. You can make anything anywhere. Uh, you know, you can cross them. But wildflowers, by definition, have distinct species. The question is, can you really have a wildflower garden? 
They have been growing the same wildflowers there for 70 years and they know exactly when they bloom. So this is an interface on a PC and the computer does its best to do the, um, um, to estimate the boundary. We try to fit it with a Rolls curve, which is a six parameter mathematical curve invented 200 years, uh, years ago. And then if it isn't right, the human can, um, can change it. If it is, if one of the top three, these are the top three candidates, the, the classifier ranks the flowers, doesn't classify them, but it ranks them only. It shows the top three candidates. If you think one of them is right, you click on it. If, uh, if you don't, you can either correct the boundary by dragging on the handles, or you can scroll to other species, or you can look at other samples of the same species. We have a three, four, five samples of every, every class. But if you don't see it among these, then you can scroll or again you can uh, correct. And so uh, there is an interplay between the machine and the... Um, and, uh, most of you can see that very likely it's the middle case, it's ranked second. It's, um, this is a case where uh, the training set is very small. So here is the general flow. Um, the machine extracts features and uh, displays the top three and we can either, the human modifies the boundary or classifies it by clicking or looks for more classes. But the important thing, which connects it to the previous slide, is this red arrow, is the fact that after you have classified it, most likely it's right. You saw humans make mistakes. Most likely it's right, so everything gets re-estimated again before you look at the next flower. So it's also adaptive. Now, the adaptation here is complicated. Uh, the system improves, but you have to be careful because the human improves too. You get better at classifying flowers. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, the engineering students uh, eventually were able to classify flowers. So uh, the point is that this kind of an interactive um, system is much, much more accurate than a machine alone. A machine alone, the top candidate is really very poor here. Very small training set. And on the other hand, it's much faster than the human alone. A, a human could, of course, look through the 100 flowers and classify it, but uh, 100 classes, there are 100 classes, 106 classes. So it's much faster than um, human alone and much more accurate than um, machine alone, you could argue about the fact that, yeah, we ought to have a better classifier. If we have a better classifier, the, in, the margin of the interactive classifier will be even greater because you don't have to very often interact. So, um, yeah, the, use the best classifier you can have, of course. So here is the same kind of thing um, in, uh, with a personal um, well, a pocket computer, a master's uh, project um, a little later. Uh, and this is, uh, I inserted these slides because this is what I would like to do, but we haven't done. These are, uh, these are ugly as sin. Uh, there are, um, these atlases have uh, about 2,000 kinds of skin diseases each. There are about 2,000 uh, conditions that a dermatologist Knows, and they are illustrated here, and they are not nearly as nice as the flowers uh, to, to, to look at. Uh, but uh, people have talked about, of course, the reason why we're looking at skin diseases rather than heart disease is because the skin diseases, you can take a picture with, with a cell phone. And um, uh, people have developed color, shape, and text uh, features. One big thing that goes for you is that almost... Uh, a skin disease, is, a skin condition is never so bad that your whole skin is, 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 is changed. So you can take a compare, you have a baseline because a person's skin is relatively uniform. If, if the boo-boo is on your left hand, take a picture of your right hand, whatever. And uh, you can also with, um, just put a filter in front of the light and take various pictures. And you can also, uh, with a cell phone, take a picture from far away and um, get a... Um, 
picture of the distribution of, of spots, for example, measles, and you can take a close-up where you can see the details of one spot. So it seems to me that um, whoop, there are a lot of uh, possible applications, these. And I'm sure that you can think of others. Um, the, uh, the big thing is that, uh, well, occasionally there isn't a dermatologist for one reason or other, or you don't want to consult a dermatologist. Sometimes you want to keep it private. But a big thing about the cell phone is that it can also ask you whether uh, you were out in the bushes yesterday, whether you were running a temperature, does it itch, do the spot change from day to day, all kinds of things like that. And it can also uh, keep a copy, look again, uh, compare it with tomorrow's picture, yesterday's picture, and so on. And possibly if it turns, if you give it permission, it can forward everything to a specialist or to the National uh, Disease Center so you can find if there is an epidemic of uh, B bytes or whatever uh, that you have. So there are uh, lots of advantages in using a cell phone and the pictures now are of course uh, I think um, good enough. Unfortunately the atlases on the web are all uh, studio um, uh, pictures with um, usually with film cameras that were digitized so there is uh, and and uh, and I have to say that it's a problem for a university engineering department uh, to take pictures of people's skin. It needs a lot of permission, so it's something that really has to be done, collaboration with uh, medical people. Okay. Um, this is a project uh, four years ago. I'll go through this rather quickly. Uh, the, it's, it's a recognition scheme where we are looking at several um, uh, several uh, at words, but uh, we don't have samples of the words. So there is a reference set of words, maybe a thousand words, but we are trying to recognize words for which we don't have uh, examples of. And the way we try to do it is by matching pieces of the word we are trying to recognize with pieces of all 1,000 words, but pieces longer than one character because one character is barely recognizable in handwriting. There isn't much uh, there. So that's um, what this thing uh, does. Adnan is teaching in Jordan. Uh, here are some examples of, um, of features. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you can't read this, <clears throat> but this XENW -pa 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 -pum is a transcription of um, of, uh, of these features, and in red is this uh, is just some some of the features. So um, there are many features, and they occur sequentially in time or in X. And for example, here uh, these two segments of these two different words match uh, by string matching, uh, some kind of a string matching algorithm. And suppose that the unknown <coughs> word is, um, is really founding and the reference uh, word is uh, amendment and there are different, uh, there are pen up and pen down here and that's why there are different colors here. But all we are showing here is one word we are trying to recognize and one example of a reference word. One of the hundred reference words or thousand reference words. Now suppose that we don't know what founding is, but we hypothesize this as contract. And we know the transcript of the reference word. We know that, the, that these two words share the bigram NT. For the reference words, we know the transcript. So if this were contract, we would expect that something in the middle, somewhere around here, would match something at the end. 
but it doesn't. So that's a little piece of evidence that maybe the world is not contract. On the other hand, if we hypothesis, hypothesize it as founding, which is actually the case, then we would expect that there would be a match in the middle and a match here, and there is actually a match. So, uh, so this contributes evidence. Now, this is only on one of the thousand reference words, but each contributes a little bit. And uh, there is some kind of a big um, Viterbi talents. This is a usual two-dimensional representation of string search. And we localize it depending on where we, roughly where we expect to ma uh, to the match to happen. So we only pay attention to matches in, in some region of this space here. And uh, this is basically the, um, some of it can be pre-computed because we know the locations of the reference words. And we know, we know the, um, the description of the words. We know the transcript of the words we are trying to recognize. We just don't have samples of the meaning. We don't have analog samples. We know how they are spelled. Otherwise, it's, it's in the dictionary. But we don't have samples of them. So it's not the conventional word recognition. And uh, here are some, um, uh, some writers. And this is a database uh, we got. And um, we, um, we do about the best uh, we do on, 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 the, on some of on the four writers we like, which are, of course, the writers on whom we do well. We do as well as the external system. And the external system between us is the IBM research system also their data, and it's a group of 15 people who have worked in on 15 years, so I was pretty happy that uh, we were um, uh, in the ballpark with that. Now, here also, yeah. yeah uh, when you're doing that, how many different, uh, do you have to run the Kirby for every possible word that you're trying to search? We are trying to so for uh, we have to run a Viterbi for every candidate every candidate transcription, but we abort early. We may not go through the full Viterbi search, and we only go through a partial Viterbi in the restricted space. And for the how many candidates? Uh, I think we have some examples. I think we have the maximum was a thousand categories. A thousand unknown candidates. Unknown categories, yes. That's correct. I, we, we only had a, a thousand uh, words, so we had to, to shift uh, in 10 writers. It's already, yeah, that, that's, that's right. And we have to run the Viterbi for everyone, except that it's only a partial Viterbi, and it's aborted beyond. And it's not that fast. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, we are, uh, this is not, not yet the thing where you write and on, on at least that implementation and, and, and it's MATLAB uh, pops up. Okay. Um, but here also, as soon as something is recognized, we add it to the reference list. And so, um, so again, um, even if we just use, now this is, I believe, on 100, um, 100 reference um, uh, words. And uh, 100 unknown words, which are different, different words. And we recognize them, but we don't touch it. We just add the recognized things to the reference list. And we rerun the same ones without ever having said what. And each iteration, it gets better. So our idea was that this is for um, if, if, um, if, uh, if you have a personal um, a computer and you are writing, eventually it will get used to your um, writing and you don't have to identify the words. This doesn't involve correcting the words, you just feed it back in. And you can see that the improvement is quite significant. Um, and so eventually, it, it essentially adds the 100, it, uh, eventually there are nearly 200 reference words, but it's as good as if there were 500 which are not representative of those. So uh, it's another example of adaptation. I'm going to skip this. This is a complicated scheme. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. If it had misclassified one of those words, would it be in a feedback loop where it would be reinforcing a false 
that's correct. That's right. That's the downside risk. And, and everybody has reservations about misclassifying. I mentioned to you that there is only one, um, one, um, one person, uh, I'll get to you, let me answer this one, is um, uh, one com uh, a guy called Maroshi, whom you probably know, who has actually written about this kind of adaptation in a commercial, uh, in a commercial situation. And um, even the, the general idea is that you fight this by only adding things that you recognize confidently. That's the natural thing to do. And that occurred to me in 1966. And I tried it. And it never worked. And Baird insisted it must work. And he spent two months, barely made it to the conference doing it. It didn't work. It doesn't work because when you add only confidently recognized words, you're adding words near the middle of the distribution. It's the boundary that you must correct. You are tweaking the boundary. So yes, it hurts, but it doesn't hurt us if um, we, we, we haven't, it usually doesn't hurt enough to count, uh, offset the good. But yeah, uh, let me come around because I will never hear. Um, once, you, I mean, once you recognize a new word and added, added it to your training set, do you, once you recognize a new word and added it to your training set, do you, is it possible to unrecognize it if you get more data? The question is, um, um, once we add the word in the new data to the new data set, is it possible as we add data further to change the label? The experiment I showed you, we reiterated the whole data set. And so in that case, it's quite possible that on the next iteration, it would have a different label. Yes. And in fact, uh, if that weren't the case, it wouldn't keep getting better. Because you would have the same label and you would have the same training. So yes, anything else? As I say, this is a very complicated um, scheme. Uh, let me talk about this. Uh, here um, we have a um, training set where um, groups are the, the, the style or the typeface is not given, but you are given groups which are told are in the same style or handwriting or, or typeface, but not which. Just that this is one group. And if you don't have that, you can do clustering and get the same thing, but you don't know which. And the test set also comes in groups, but there is no correspondence between the training set and the test set. And so in other words, so you don't know that the, 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 this is uh, a Bookman uh, uh, size 12. And um, what we classify instead of single characters is fields, which may be an entire document, minimum of two characters. So this is not classifying anymore a character at a time, and the idea is this, and many of you have seen this. So the question is whether these, this is a one or a seven. How many of you think it's a one? Huh? Yeah. Hmm? Nobody? No, the one on the right. Yeah. The one on the right? Yeah. Well, some of you are wrong. Now, instead of looking at one character, we look at all four of them. Do you change your mind? <laughs> so that was the one on the right. But really, there was uh, no evidence because we really tried to make them uh, look, look the same. So this is the idea in style classification. This is highly simplified because, um, yeah, this is highly simplified, but this is the idea. So uh, here if we have, uh, this, this would be what you would get for a singlet classifier. And again, if you are classifying, if you happen to figure out which kind it is by looking at all the patterns in the field, you can change the boundary and do better. 
And you can do that, and this is again simplified because you classify everything at once, and I'm only showing the boundary for a single pair of classes, and I can't show it on 2D, uh, the boundaries for all the classes at the same time. This is a tricky slide, and those of you who have done classification will understand that it's a one-feature classifier, not two features, it's one feature, but it's showing uh, there's only one feature in each character. These are A's and these are B's. There are two kinds of A's and two kinds of B's, and the picture shows the feature for two patterns, not one. You see that? It's so, uh, so um, this distribution of patterns is an A1 and an A1. This is an A1 and an A2. This one is an A1 and a B1, and an A2 and a B2. I don't have here any A2, B1. It would be here. There are no mixed styles here only pure styles, and I expect only pure styles. If I had, if there were no constraint on which patterns, which pair of patterns occurs at once, then each of these would be four distributions, and the optimal boundary between the four classes, there are four classes, A, 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 B, B, A, B, B, the optimal boundary would be this. That is the thing what the singlet classifier does. Since there is no constraint between, um, we don't know any more about the second pattern when we have seen the first or the other way, uh, we might as well classify each individually. But if we know that they always occur in same style pairs, the optimal boundary is this. And this is done by simply uh, plotting these Gaussians and uh, numerically finding, um, there's no analytical expression for that. It's a mixture of Gaussians and there's no analytical expression, but we can numerically determine the boundary. Is, is this picture here? I think this is somewhat difficult to, uh, picture. So this is what style classification, this is one aspect of style classification, of classifying two patterns instead of one. Um, now, if, um, if we were doing a field classification in the, you might think it's like word classification. So if you have to classify sequences of four digits, you train on all possible sequences of four digits on every possible word. That's word classification. But if you are doing digits, there are too many. However, with a Gaussian assumption, the style classification you can train on only every pair. That's still more than training on every singlet, but from training on pairs, you now find out all possible relations, and you know the relation between this and this, and this and this, and this and this, and, this, and uh, you can get an optimal classifier. Um, and uh, this shows um, uh, this classifier on an really non-Gaussian data, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, SD3, and SD training set. One of them is a more difficult data set than the other. And you can see that you can, for fields of two, you get some gain. For fields of five, you, you get much more gain. Of course, the reason why the error rate is higher for fields of um, Five is because uh, we are counting field errors, not singlet errors. So obviously there's more chance of making an error in one of five characters than in one of one. But it's much better with fields of five. And again, uh, this uh, so style classification is kind of a good thing. Um, this is uh, with support vector machines, and it's again a difficult slide. Suppose that you have a triple X1, X2, X3. There are two styles, A1 and A2, B1 and B2, C1 and C, C1 and C2, I'm sorry. And uh, we classify, we have three linear classifier, pairwise linear classifiers. Now in this region, because of the fact that this 
first kind of C and this second kind of A are so near each other, they are easily confused. So the probability of this being, uh, this X1 being a C is slightly higher than it being an A. And it could well be that it's on the wrong side. So we have, suppose we have three patterns, our temptation would be to call this a C, C, a B. That's what a singlet classifier would do. But that's inconsistent because the second one is classified as a C of the second kind. And so we really think it must be a mistake and um, be a B or something. Is that the one? I'm not sure. And um, you, so you can, what you do is calculate for all styles the probability of all of them being in the same style and pick the maximum. And so uh, this is a way to use um, support vector machines. You can also have training on each style separately, and then you have many more regions, and the classification is much more complicated because you have to, um, each classifier assigns a zero and a one to an unknown pattern, and if you have uh, two patterns, it's a big table. And... Um, you can still find, um, you still uh, get a big gain. Uh, this is with singlets and, um, all right, all this shows is that again, with, um, uh, with increasing field side, you go faster. Now, what happens if nothing works? Uh, this is my concept of, um, of a multidimensional space where there are classes, these have to be equidistant because if they were in the alphabet, the, the representation would have changed over hundreds of years. Because with the same F, you can make the space between classes bigger, but only by making the classes more complicated. It'll take you longer to write, bigger to print. So, if, so naturally, everything has evolved, and this is experimentally verified to to be at the vertices of a multidimensional tetrahedron, 26-dimensional tetrahedron, regular tetrahedron in the case of the uh, lowercase alphabet. Because again, if two were closer, then you could decrease the one that make the two, those two farther at the expense of the two that were farther. And then in addition to that, there are styles in each which are governed by different distributions. Here there are four styles for each class. So it gets complicated to, um, to think about the optimal Gaussian classifier. But okay, now here is a question. What do you think is the, um, this is a weakly constrained situation. What do you think is that class over there? What's your best guess? Hmm? Which? It's a four, yeah. It's probably a four. It probably is a four, yeah. It's some transformation. So. Uh, but uh, this we haven't solved yet, and, but, but I'm sure that something interesting can be done. But uh, what the people usually do is go to linguistic concept, and I will go to a very old thing. Here is a situation where you don't know the classes, but you, uh, you cluster them, and all the n's are put into cluster two, because they look different in some feature space. Uh, so we give a name to each cluster, an arbitrary number, and then we have something that I call the ciphertext. It's an encrypted version of the data, so the output of that unknown sentence is this. And then um, we have a language model which decodes it, either uh, an n-gram frequencies or a lexicon, and we have done this a number of uh, times. Um, here is one that was with Steen Ho. So here is the unknown text. And can you read it? So the experts in uh, this is a, a bizarre typeface. It's uh, actually the typeface is called Spitzglyphs. But uh, many of you don't know it, I see. Maybe it's too small. Here is the same thing in 22-point type. Still hard. <laughs> so uh, we apply the, uh, the algorithm I just showed you. 
this is the actual uh, ground truth. This is what the algorithm gets. So it's not so bad. It makes mistakes for various reasons that we, we understand. But it's, it's not so bad. So, so here is an example where language context is everything and shape is nothing except that we are assuming that every pattern has different shape. Every class has different shape not, and independent noise. But other than that, there is no assumption of a, no predefined concept of, of, of the shape of the alphabetic characters. Like you're assuming English, though? Yeah. You, you are assuming that it's English text. If it is I'm, I'm, language. Uh, you're absolutely right. I'm assuming the language. You're right. Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good. Important assumption. Yeah. Um, Important um, assumption, yeah. And, and uh, all, both the dictionaries and the n-gram frequencies are hideously uh, different. And English is nice. Be, um, uh, for Italian, you need much bigger vocabulary. OK, uh, I think that's, um, OK, what I, I want to say is, uh, this is the only, I think this is the only equation that I have shown. Um, what I want to say that in style context, we are assuming that there is statistical dependence between the features, the shape features of the pattern. In language context, we are only assuming that there is statistical dependence between the class labels of the pattern. So the formulation is really very different and the solution is different. Okay? That's the mathematical difference. All right, here is the uh, uh, conclusion. I do. Thank you. No, it would be. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.